Hi, I'm Brad Geiger, the creator of Evil Inc., the editor of webcomics.com, and the co-host of Comic Lab. You can check me out at Twitter at Geiger and at my website, evil-inc.com. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. To Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. It has been a long time, and I am so excited to have this guest back on the show. It's been about 13 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> The last time was at C2E2 2012 at the Webcomic Pavilion. I gave him the moniker, the godfather of webcomics. We are joined today by the ever-talented Brad Geiger. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. That was fantastic. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm doing absolutely wonderful. I know it's been far too long since we last talked, but I was always curious uh, if you remember that that godfather of webcomics comment. And, and did you ever get that cat that you... Uh, you know, the white fluffy cat that you were going to stroke and, you know, plan world domination of the comic industry. Did did you ever do that? Hope you don't mind. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a that's a big compliment because uh, there's, there's there's a lot of people that that uh, maybe deserve that mantle a little bit better than I do. But uh, but I appreciate the thoughtfulness behind it. So you're right. There are many people that have been in the, the comic industry and web comic industry from back when we started the show in 2008. You've yeah. been an amazingly talented person with, with Evil Inc. and webcomics.com. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, as I normally do. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and shame on them for not knowing you, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Uh, my name is Brad Geiger, and I started doing web comics in February of 2000. So I and I've been publishing continuously ever since. I started with a comic strip that was called Greystone Inn that turned into Evil Inc. after five and a half years, and then in about 2016, I reimagined the comic strip as a graphic novel, I rebooted it, and it's been going ever since. Uh, I've also done uh, for the last 10 plus years, uh, webcomics.com, which is an advice and tutorial site for other independent cartoonists uh, that I started in 2010, uh, back before the web was really ready for subscriptions at that point. In fact, I, I got a massive pushback on uh, doing webcomics.com as a subscription site. It was night and day different from the idea of uh, Patreon and other subscription sites that we have today. Uh, it was it was very, very different. What is the most misunderstood aspect of, about being a comic creator in today's world that people who don't follow comics misunderstand? Yeah, I, I, I think the biggest one, and, and I think it was one that I misunderstood uh, an awful lot, is that the amount of time that people like me spend not drawing and not writing, right? It's, it's, it's a question that comes up all the time. I actually start to chart it here and there where I can say, okay, in, in one eight or nine hour day at the studio, how much time am I spending writing and drawing? And the answer is not nearly as much as you might think. A lot of it is going towards social media. A lot of it is going towards just administration things, just, just business things like uh, paying your estimated taxes or keeping track of expenses and, and just keeping a budget. A lot of it is just the nuts and bolts of doing business on the web, like website maintenance. And when something goes upside down, you've got to you got to fix that. Most of my day ends up getting chewed away by these little things that aren't writing and aren't drawing. Great example, I'd say about 80, 80%, 85% of the people that access the web are doing it on their smartphone, right? That's had to change how people like me present our work. Uh, and we saw it coming for a long time. For years and years, we knew the smartphone was coming. Yeah. And now it's undeniable. So now if I'm doing a comic strip or if I'm doing my graphic novel, I've got to make sure that that thing appears as a vertical scroll. Uh, and my website has a desktop version. 
but it has a phone version that it automatically switches to if the user is using a phone. It's gone beyond advisable and it's gone right into being crucial that if you want your stuff to be read, it's got to be in a, in a vertical scroll. Or if, for example, on Instagram, it's a horizontal scroll. You're going panel by panel. The screen is small. And nobody wants to pinch and zoom and move out their finger all around. It's, it, it's, it's hard enough to get somebody to actually slow their scroll down long enough to get you to, to, to read something. You're going to ask them to pinch and zoom. I see people putting four panel comic strips on Twitter. Yeah. And, it, and I, I, I pull my hair out by the roots because it's like, you might have good stuff. Nobody's ever going to know because you're literally hiding in plain sight. Nobody's going to pinch and zoom and do all that stuff. All that being said, that means that every comic that I do, I've got to prepare it so that it can be broken down into a vertical scroll. Every page that I design, I have to plan in advance. If I'm doing a, 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 a not so standard layout, if I'm, I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit, I've got to still make sure that I can crop that into chunks that I can put into a vertical scroll or else I'm not going to be building audience and I'm going to be losing ground. All of that takes time. Uh, you, in fact, Thursdays in my uh, studio, I do that. And I think yesterday, it might have taken me as much as an hour, uh, maybe an hour plus, because I, it's just not a vertical scroll. You got to have it in one format for Twitter. It's got to be one format for Instagram. If you're mirroring your site on Webtoons, something like that, I've got a whole bunch of folders with all this other stuff fine-tuned so that it shows up right in the place I'm putting it. That has nothing to do with drawing, nothing to do with writing, nothing to do with what 12-year-old Brad thought being a cartoonist would be like. Yeah. But then again, 12-year-old Brad had no idea of everything that was in store for actually being a cartoonist. But to answer your question is, one of the things people don't understand just how precious little time I actually get to write and draw. Yeah. It's amazing. The, like you said, the administrative side of things, like just the show alone, it's literally, I'm going to five different social media sites just to try to get traction for yes. things like this. And, and live streams are a great way to do it as well too. So Technology has evolved and changed as much as we haven't, but we try to do our best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that was really, that's the big thing right now is I'm 53 at this point. I've been doing this for over 20 years and that's always the specter, the phantom off the side of my peripheral vision. When do I lose my ability to keep up with the changes? Because we web cartoonists have, have gone through, I think I counted, I technically consider this the fifth age of web comics. We've gone through four major ground shifts in how we did business and how we presented ourselves. And we've been and and, and we've been able to uh, swing with them pretty good. But at some point, I, I'm just scared at some point uh, I get thrown from the horse and I'm not able to get back on, you know, because things are changing very, very quick, especially right now with artificial intelligence and Web3 issues that keep popping up. Uh, there's a lot of changes. It's, it, it, it's, it's easy to get a little bit overwhelmed by it uh, sometimes and just sit quivering in the corner. <laughs> you know, you've had a lot of uh, creative talents over the years here as well to uh, webcomics.com. Obviously, it's been an amazing staple for advice and creativity as well. Dave Collette, of course, we can't we can't talk about, of course, the Comic Lab podcast without talking about Dave Collette. I mean, right. For a little history, and, and I'm sure you can fine tune this a lot better than I can. The Half Pixel crew back in the early 2000s and probably earlier than that was a group of four very talented, creative people that are still very talented and creative. Yourself, oh, yeah. Scott Kurtz, Dave Collette, and Chris Straub. Speaking of which, how are all of those guys doing? They're all doing great. They're all doing great. Scott is working on a young adult graphic novel right now. He just turned in his first book and he's working on the second one. He's doing very, very well. Chris is doing fantastic. I think he's doing a lot of stuff with the Penny Ar uh, Arcade crew. He's doing stuff with Acquisitions Incorporated. Chris was always the one among us that was like, uh, it, it, you can't even call him a triple threat. He's a quadruple threat, a quintuple threat. He, he's one of these people that can do everything, you know, acting, music, uh, writing comedy, performing comedy. He's amazing. 
And Dave, listen, Dave is, he's got a special place in my heart. We've been doing Comic Lab for five years now. Uh, every week we've been putting out two podcast episodes, one public and then an extra one for our Patreon backers. And it all started out of our love for just picking up the phone and talking comics. And he, and finally, we just, we just decided that we should have some microphones on. Uh, because it was it was too good uh, to, to to pass up, and and we'd be talking anyway. Uh, we might as well uh, record these conversations, and and the result is a podcast that very much people keep uh, telling us it reminds them of. There was a radio call-in show on NPR called Car Talk, mm-hmm. and it was where these two old guys people would call in and tell them what was wrong with their car, and then these two brothers would would try to uh, figure out what was wrong with their car but the whole time they were taking shots at each other and laughing and they just i i loved watching or listening to the show because uh their friendship and the love for each other was so contagious i didn't i i I can't change my oil i i can barely keep the air pressure up in my in my tires but i would listen to that show every week and it's a real compliment when people say uh that they they're reminded of car talk when they listen to comic lab because it's got a lot of those same elements people write in with questions and we try to give them our best thoughts on it uh with each of us having 20 plus years of experience but mainly we're, we're just there to you know take shots at each other and, and, and make fun of each other you know that's that's the best part <laughs> it is 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 just being able to kind of uh have fun during that hour talking comics with uh with an old friend hey you, you've lasted this long in in comics it's great to have solid friendships uh, all yeah. the way around too and and it, i'm sure it makes your day go by when it, whenever you see someone that is a close friend like those amazing people do so well as they as they currently are as well it's, it, it's i love that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. I look forward. We record on Tuesdays, and I literally look forward to it every week. It, it, I know not only is it going to be a great time, but it's uh, my heart is going to feel full afterwards. And, and literally, I plan you know, that uh, administration uh, yeah. stuff that I was talking about. I plan a lot of that for Tuesdays because I'm so creatively drained at the end of recording <laughs> those two shows that I'm good for nothing. I, I That's a good day to do my profit loss sheets or do you know, my taxes or <laughs> any of those kind of business things. That's a good day to see, slice up vertical scroll stuff uh, because creatively i'm tapped out i've got nothing at the end of that day you know everyone usually asks what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bs piece of advice that you've ever received but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received? the second wise that's a perceptive question the second wisest i'm not sure how to quantify it i'll tell you the best piece of advice i never wanted How's that? Okay. Uh, that that because I think that that that's going to fit, and it's also right up there in the top two or three pieces of advice. Uh, you remember Robert Koo? He was the business mm-hmm. uh, manager for Penny Arcade. Yeah. We were sitting at a convention one time, and we were talking. And and I and and by the way, if you're at home and you're a web cartoonist or any kind of an independent cartoonist, and this it, it, tell me if this sounds familiar. And I was doing Grace Tune in, I think back at the time. I said, you know what, Robert? I think I could be so much more popular i think i could i could really get to the next level i i think i could get to the point where maybe someday i could quit my day job if i could just get more people to look at my comic if i could just get more eyes on my comic i think if they if they saw it they would love it the problem is getting them to see it but by the way tell me if any of this sounds familiar because it's one of the top three concerns of every creative person on the web, right? And that was my obsession, right? How do I get people to just look at it? If they look at it, they'd like it. And he said, and Robert was always very direct. He said, you have the audience you deserve. And I said, what? (laughs) Wait, wait, what? I have the, he says, you have the audience that you've earned. And he says, if you want a bigger audience, you've got to uh, take a good look at the barriers to entry and remove those. So is it your art? You've got to improve the art. Is it your writing? You've got to improve the writing. And uh, just between you and me, nine chances out of 10, having done this for over 20 years, most of the time it's the writing. A lot of us come into this because we're artists. I did. I came in because I was an art guy. 
And it took me years to figure out that the art is important, but the writing is crucial. The writing is super important. And good writing saves art all the time, but great art can never save terrible writing. It just, it just can't, unless it's a very, very special circumstance. I'm sure there's an outlier somewhere somebody will point me to, but go along with, with, with this uh, thought that I've got going here. And that is that he said, you've got to take a look at how you're putting it out there, how you're presenting it. Those are all important. But he said, what happens is you can worry about all this stuff, but as your work improves, it's going to gather a bigger and bigger audience. And I'm telling you, that's the day. And, and by the way, I won't say that's the day because that's a lie. I walked away thinking for sure that he was full of shit, right? I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm Brad Geiger. Don't you know my mom Geiger's a special little boy? There's no way. There's no way. It wasn't until a long time I, that I, I, I reflected on that advice. And then I started looking at my writing with a real critical eye. I really started to look at my writing, the cheap kind of writing tricks that I was relying on. And the fact that I wasn't pushing myself, I wasn't editing. I wasn't, I wasn't really giving it my full attention. I wasn't paying attention to the writing. And that's when I stopped looking for magic hashtags and stopped looking for SEO tricks and stopped looking for a, a demographic edge. <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped looking for all the gimmicks, all right? Because it hit me. He had a good point. And when I stopped looking for gimmicks, I stopped looking for this one thing that's going to bring a million people to my site today. I started focusing on the quality doing a better comic because I wasn't doing a good comic at that point. And when I started fo focusing on that, I started to build audience slowly, slowly. That's the worst thing about all this stuff. I wish I could tell you that it was, uh, it was a night and day. No, this, this thing takes, it took years and years to develop years and years to, uh, to develop a, uh, an audience uh, and to build that. But honest to goodness, there's no other way, right? You know those people that uh, hit you up on your Instagram DMs and say that they can get you, uh, you know, uh, three three thousand followers for fifty bucks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know that's a scam. Yeah. There's only one way to do this. And the other thing is, I finally, I finally really took this thought uh, experiment to the to the full extent. I said, okay, what would happen if I could wave a magic wand? And I could bring a million people to my website or to my Twitter page or, you know, wherever, bring a million eyeballs to my comic today. What would happen? What would happen? And it made me look at that comic in a completely different light because I realized if I waved that magic wand and brought a million people to my comic, uh, let's just say for the sake of argument, website, we could talk about all the people who are rolling their eyes because they think websites are out of date. Yeah. I got news for you. I, I got news for you. They're still very, very important. Yeah. But let's say, let's say that I brought a million website visitors today to my website. The question then is, would I keep them? Would they come back tomorrow? It were, would they be presented with a comic today? knowing nothing about the previous backstory or anything else. Remember, they're going to come in today, which means that today they're going to see page 13. Uh, they're going to see chapter 14, page 13. All right. Right in the middle of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Is there something there that's going to capture them? Have I made that page? Did I give an entry point to that page for somebody who doesn't know what's going on? So they can at least figure out what the character tectonics are. Did I write that page in such a way that it's got a shot, a shot at keeping somebody? What my thought experiment led me to is I could wave that magic wand and bring a million viewers to my website today. Problem is they wouldn't be there tomorrow because I wasn't doing that at that point. I wasn't thinking about each one of those updates as a self-contained thing. I do a long form comic. I don't do short form humor anymore. I don't do a strip. I'm doing long form. That's a big challenge to write each one of those sections in such a way that, and sometimes I fail. It, it, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Sometimes I fail. But my goal every time is to have some kind of an entry point on the first panel and something significant happening in the last panel. That's the other part of the formula as I've kind of uh, put it together. I, something has to happen 
in that last panel. So many times you see long form creators on the web, they'll devote a page to somebody making coffee. Panel one is them grabbing the coffee cup <laughs> and they've got you to the grinding beans, they're filling water. And then by the last panel, they're sipping coffee. Well, I got news for you. Nobody looks at that and say, oh my God, I got to see more of this. I got to see, I got to see it. Maybe tomorrow he dips a Danish, you know, no, nobody was interested in that. You've got to make something happen significant on each one of those updates. When I started thinking about my comic in those terms, then I started to see improvement, but I had to stop looking for magic hashtags and, and, and weird SEO tricks and stuff like that. I had to start focusing on the quality and specifically the writing. And that's the one thing I didn't want to do because here's the thing. Hashtags are easy. Yeah. SEO is simple. Yeah. Becoming a better writer is devastatingly hard. <laughs> At least it was for me. You get better with practice and get better with experience, whether it's as a, as a comic creator or even as a podcast. So, I mean, it's taken me 15 years just to to get to whatever level I'm at. And I don't even know what level I'm at. So yeah. it's it's a fun experience and it's a fun journey to find your creativity. And, and I think that that kind of leads into Evil Link itself because you've been doing this for so long. It's been an amazing comic as well too. You've linked, of course, the the not safe for work stuff, of course, to your Patreon as well, which I think is a brilliant move in, in my personal opinion. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hoped readers of your work will feel after oh. reading it? Boy, that's that's the gold star question. This is this is why you're very good at, at what you do. That because there is there is it's Phil Folio's Xenophile X X X E N O P H I L E. Uh, way back in the day, in the late seventies, I think early eighties, if I if I've got it right, uh, Phil Folio, who does a comic called Girl Genius, along with Kaya Folio, his wife, back in the day, he did a triple X rated sci-fi fantasy comic okay and i stumbled upon this thing and i uh i was amazed by it because it was it was it was a sex comic there was no no bones about that it was it was everything that you're envisioning nudity sexual content sexual stuff happening but it was also wickedly funny amazingly friendly the people were happy Right, the, the people were were overjoyed and happy, and 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 it was it was it was all it was the closest to a family friendly sex comic I'd, I'd ever seen, yeah. and and the concepts were uh, uh you know it was Phil Folio, so the concepts were were very smart, very uh, intriguing, uh, it was it was great stuff, and I looked at that and I said I, if I ever do that kind of thing. And I've been leaning towards it for a long time. You can see back in Evil Link, this is the, the, the road to NSFW has been paved for a long yeah. time. This <laughs> has been leading there for a long time. I said, if I ever do that, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I want to do uh, happy, friendly sex comics that are funny and that are intriguing and that are well-written, that, that have stories, that have meaning. I was right on the precipice. This goes back to New York Comic Con several years ago. I was on the precipice. I think I'm going to do this thing. I had put a couple practice balloons out uh, on my Patreon, and my readers were very, very supportive of it. So I pulled Phil aside. Uh, he was at the New York Comic Con. And I said, hey, would you mind if I, if I picked your brain about doing uh, Not Safe for Work comics? And he said, sure. I ended up taking him to an Indian restaurant uh, somewhere within walking distance. We sat there and talked about this topic and he listened to my concerns. He told me about you know, pitfalls to avoid, uh, you know, uh, some guidance, some advice, but a lot of listening and a lot of reassurance took an amazing amount of time with me. And by the time I left, I, I kind of knew that I was going to do this thing. I had decided uh, without a doubt that this was something that I wanted to, uh, to pursue. I don't think I would have had quite an, such a, uh, an easy time deciding to uh, just in one fell swoop, but doggone it, I'm going to do it. I think I would have uh, snuck up on it a whole lot more <laughs> than I did. But when I talked to Phil, he, he really gave me a lot of guidance and advice and, uh, and, and really it was a huge turning point, uh, for my career because the funny thing happened was when I started doing NSFW behind for just strictly for my Patreon backers, all of a sudden 
they started paying attention to the public version, which was PG-13, much, much more closely. Mm. And, and it actually turned into this virtual cycle that the NSFW created more of an interest in what was going on out front. What was going on out front gave more interest because I would always have, maybe if, if there was, I, there, a lot of times a storyline is continued in Evil Inc. After Dark when it reaches a certain point that I can't you know, uh, put it out in public anymore. So that would hand off to Evil Inc. After Dark. Evil Inc. After Dark would make people more interested in, in the public facing and it became something that kind of fed on itself. It was a big turning point, which is why, it's such a delight right now. I don't know whether you know about this, but the National Cartoonist Society uh, just uh, released its nominations for their Silver Rubin Awards, which is what they used to call them their divisional awards. And they've got a category for a long form online comic. And the three nominees are Dave Kellett, my co-host for Comic Lab, Phil Folio, huh. somebody who's mentored and, and really been a, a sweet guy to me, and me. So... <laughs> No matter who wins, and when we go to that ceremony later on this September, literally, and I've, I've said similar, well, I was up for an Eisner once, and I always said, it's just an honor to be nominated. It was an honor to be nominated. I said that over and over. It was an honor to be nominated. I got to be honest with you. When I didn't get that award, it was not an honor to be nominated. I wanted to win that award. I'm going to be happy as a, a, as a damn kid, uh, no matter who wins, because if Dave wins, I, I respect that guy so much. And he's such a sweet guy and, and he deserves it. He's a fantastic cartoonist. If Phil wins, same story. And if I win, screw those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go up and make my announcement. But no, seriously, I, I, I could be happy no matter what, because they're all great guys. Funny you mentioned Phil because I had him back on the show uh, actually at the beginning of this year. So, yeah. and similar to in your case, it had been 14 years since I had last spoken to him. So, yeah, you know, I'm trying to go back through my old archive and I want to pick the brains of past guests that I've had on the show. And I think uh, I think I have to met, you know talk to Scott and and Dave and Chris. You know, yeah. get them get them back on for a little bit longer chat in, in the future hopefully someone can make that happen what was an early experience where you learned that language had power oh wow uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, as, as somebody who tries to write humor and <laughs> and I, I i always kind of step back as uh, from saying that i'm a humor writer i'm somebody that tries to write humor <laughs> uh, uh the power of language really comes through when you try to write a joke uh because you could you could come up with a great concept you could come up with a very good concept. And if you've got the wrong word in there, or if you've got too many words in there, or if you've got the wrong, uh, the words in the wrong order, or, or if there's a way that's uh, uh, to do it, that's a little bit quicker, has a little bit better rhythm, has a little bit better tonality to it. it it's the difference between a, a, a joke that's not funny, a joke that's kind of funny, and something that's very funny. And it, and it really all comes down to language. Language is extremely, extremely powerful. It'll knock you on your butt uh, as the minute you try to write humor because it, it really comes down to word use. And it also has an effect on people as well, too, not only through and, and especially in today's age with technology and, and anonymity and you know, yeah. meeting fans at conventions and everything like that. There, there's a lot of interactions where a, a simple mis, misphrase could turn someone's happy day into a sad one at that. I yeah, mean. that's the truth. That's very much the truth. And I don't think we, uh, I, words have become so disposable now that I don't think we think about the words we use so much because, you know, you, you, you fire off a tweet and you don't think about it anymore. You know, it might be nice to get back to a place where we think about what we say, me included, <laughs> you know, because I know my wife is going to hear this and I, they'll, they'll be the first thing she'll look over at me and say is, yeah, yeah, you should talk. You, you should be the first one to think about. Uh, and she's right. Uh, but it, it's something that we all could do a little bit better is be a little bit more careful with our words. What challenges do comic creators face in today's world that needs to be addressed? Uh, well, listen, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't immediately start talking about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, especially in its uh, application of art and writing. That's a big one. That And, and that's what the writer strike is. One of the main issues that the uh, Hollywood writer strike is revolving around. 
And it's something that's coming for us as comics artists as well, a, a little bit. I, I'll give you my whole AI thought. And I don't know whether, whether this is helpful or not. Let's start with this. I, I don't think anybody is upset about AI as a technology. The whole idea behind AI as a technology is perfectly fine. The problem that most artists have with it is that it was never opt in. Our work and other people's work, photographs, illustrations, so on and so forth, were kind of fed into this thing without any thought to, hey, can we have your permission? Can we compensate you? Can we talk about what it might look like if you were to opt in? Uh, it was more of a, in fact, very few times was it even opt out. It was just the option was made by somebody in another room. That, that, that was it. And that really, that, that issue of consenting to have your work part of this and the ramifications of that, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I can't speak for everybody, but that's, uh, that's, that's what many people are upset about uh, is that there is that thing. Now, taking that uh, uh, on its face, the problem is it's not going away, right? Technology never goes away. It, it, it just doesn't, right? So now the question is, how do we go forward with that? I've got a couple thoughts on that. Number one, I really do think that right now we are in a big, big novelty phase. There's lots of news stories about this guy that did a children's book using AI art, and it's, it's being sold right now, and it's, it's, selling, it's on the bestseller list and this and that. And newspapers jump at these stories very eagerly, right? The full story is somewhere uh, a little bit more nuanced. And we're seeing a lot of these. Somebody's written it, and it's a lot of children's book stuff, uh, simple sentences, one sentence on a page, illustration. We're in a novelty phase right now where we're seeing a lot of that. And right now, Amazon is getting flooded with a bunch of things that are word soup, just novels that you couldn't actually read them, but they're being uploaded and then they get bots to read through them on Kindle Unlimited and they generate a little bit of money for each one that gets read and they're gaming the system that way. Meanwhile, finding an actual book on Kindle Unlimited is more and more difficult because you can't separate the signal from the noise. So what does that mean? Well, number one, I think the novelty aspect is going to wear off pretty soon. After we've heard our 50th story about somebody that made a children's book with AI, at some point, they're going to start asking, is this work good? Is it good? Is it a good book? Is it a good comic? And right now, not so much. Not so much. And, and yes, I know it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's but at some point... There's a level of creativity that we have that I refuse to believe an AI can duplicate, right? Because writing a novel, a story, point A to point B is one thing, but a, a story that has nuance and surprise and subtext and a hidden, a good story, that's going to be another thing. I, I, and I'll believe that when I see it. There are some questions towards the end of this interview that I've been putting together for the last 12 years for a documentary called Little Person Amongst Media Giants. And I, I believe I asked a, a version of this way back when to, towards everyone actually at that very first C2E2, and I've been running with it ever since. So we'll get to those in a, in a second. And then there's a fifth fun one at the very end. So that's something that is rarely being heard these days. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? Oh, I, I, ha. I want to say boredom. I want to <laughs> say boredom uh, because that's when I'm at my most creative is when I'm at my most bored. And part, sometimes when I'm, I'm facing writer's block, the biggest obstacle to getting writing again, to getting creative again, is allowing myself to get bored because that means turning the computer off, turning my phone off. Uh, you know, putting books down and putting them out of reach and allowing myself to really get bored. It's hard to do these days because we're surrounded by so many distractions. And it's also difficult to make that conscious decision to cut. My first guess is boredom. My second guess is trying to be attractive when you're not so attractive. 
right? It's a way I know an awful lot of cartoonists <laughs> that that were they weren't the football the star in school, they weren't the cheerleader in school, but they could do this and they could get noticed and they could get a little bit of attention, right? I know that certainly was the case for me. I did that because it was one way that I could get attention because I wasn't going to be a baseball star. I wasn't going to be a, a lot of things, but this I could do. And I hear that story from a lot of my friends that are in comics. They did that because this was a way that it was a healthy way they could get attention. And so my second guest would be that, was that it, it was a way for somebody to get more attention than, than they would have otherwise been able to get. You know, that's, that's my second one. My third guest is Spike, because that's always been a major drive uh, in my entire career is spite. I got, I started doing this because the newspaper syndicate said I couldn't. I said, I'll show you. I'm going to put my stuff up on Google cities. I'm going to build such a big audience that you're going to, you're going to come crawling to me. And that didn't happen, but I kept going because if not today, then tomorrow, one of these days, they're going to come crawling on their knees. It's been 20 some years. Uh, <laughs> they are not crawling on their knees to me. They, they've got other things going on and, and, you know, God love them. But, but that spite has been driving everything that I do that I'll show them kind of thing has been at the background. So it's, it's got to be one of those three things, boredom, spite, or getting attention. And uh, what's that old phrase saying, uh, become an artist and you'll never have any money to do anything else? <laughs> well, uh, it, 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 there is there, it, there is a part of that, that that involves this period of time that you kind of go all in on that. And, and things get very lean during those, time, during those years. The ComCon scene, I should say, has, has been vastly uh, amazing over the past 20 or so years here from brand new conventions popping up to digital comic conventions I've seen as well too here. What do comic conventions hold for you in your heart when you visit one for the first time? Uh, fond memories. I realized well over 10 years ago that comic conventions were a bad business decision. And so I stopped going. <laughs> I stopped going against an exhibit altogether well over 10 years ago because I wasn't making money. I had to take a really hard look at uh, the amount of money I was spending going to conventions and the amount of money I was making. And I wasn't making enough profit. Sometimes it wasn't making any profit. Uh, that, that weekend at C2E2, I think I came home in the hole uh, on that one. It was a hard decision, but I, I stopped going to conventions a long time ago. Uh, and I've been really trying, Comic Lab, I've been really trying to convince people that they they should at least consider that before they go. They can, should consider the cost. And the pushback on that at all is always networking and stuff like that and, and, the, and the intangibles. I'm telling you, that's, that's an awful expensive way to network. Uh, and, and you better be doing some amazing networking if you're going to be doing that. And especially if you're putting that stuff on a credit card, you're going to make your, your, your eventual transition into business uh, very difficult if you're saddling yourself with that kind of stuff. However, having said that, in the early 2000s, comic conventions were great. I did about 12, between 8 and 12 a year. I, I did a lot of comic conventions because in the early days, they were profitable. Okay, they, they were very profitable. Uh, unfortunately, those comic conventions don't exist anymore. And uh, comic conventions in general really aren't about comics anymore. And by the way, I don't even think that's a bad thing, right? I, it's like, it's become about cosplay. It's become about getting autographs from actors and so forth. I think that's okay. I think that's great. That's what the people want. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Okay, I, I, I'm not one of these people that are kind of down on the mouth about, oh, well, kind of, they don't make them like they used to and, and all this other stuff. I'm okay with that because at the same time that started happening, crowdfunding started coming around, things like Kickstarter and Patreon. And the fact of the matter is, is that once people did get used to uh, putting money on a website, uh, right, on Kickstarter and Patreon, something that back when I started webcomics.com, they did not want to do. They didn't, didn't want to do it, didn't trust it, didn't think they should have to. The, uh, the attitudes are a lot different. 
And at the same time, comic conventions receded, uh, crowdfunding crested. And I would wager that many of us are in a much better position today doing crowdfunding than we were back in the early 2000s doing comic conventions and ad revenue from our websites. Uh, I, we're in a much, most of us, not everybody, but most of us are in a much, much better place today. And that's what I also notice when I talk to a lot of the creative people, whether they're in comics or film or, or music or video games. I The crowdfunding has been a staple for, like you said, for, for their business model, for their comics yeah. and for their products. And it's great to see. But running a Kickstarter, running a crowdfunding campaign is like a, a second job usually. It's It's very difficult and very time consuming, much like we were talking earlier about how social media was shouting into the void. It felt yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's the truth. And it can, it, it, it can, it can, it, you can get burned uh, uh, with a successful Kickstarter or a six, uh, being successful on Patreon. It, it can be, you can make promises that are difficult to keep. It's very, very uh, hard to do good crowdfunding. But then again, that's what our challenge is. Right. You can look at that and say, oh, geez, you know, I'm, I'm you, know, you can be frustrated, disappointed. But on the other hand, right, <laughs> if you can you can take what we're talking about here, being your own business person and, and, and using social media and crowdfunding and so forth. You can take all of that on one hand. On the other hand, your other choice is to sign with a corporation uh, in comics, a newspaper syndicate, a corporate comic uh, publisher any other publisher in general, right? Uh, the problem with that is, is that we've had 120 years of comics history during which for the entire span of time, there are very precious few people who survived that system. Very few creative people. A lot of people at the top who did just well, uh, just, just fantastic, but very few creative people that came through that system of working with publishers and syndicates and corporations. Very few of those people came out good at the end. They, they came out in good shape. I will argue that there was a very small span of time for newspaper syndication, where if you got selected, if you made it through the gate, uh, you could become a millionaire as a creative person. And, and you did very, very well, because at that point, let's call it 50s through the 70s and, and into the 80s. you got to include the 80s. During that time, newspapers were a dominant media force and a comic strip was a, a huge part of that dominant media. So if you got on the comics page, you could write your ticket. Aside from that, which by the way is gone, never coming back, right? The, those days are gone. Newspapers are almost dead and newspaper syndicates are not coming back from that they're just not okay other than that you know you go to the, the Siegel and Shuster who created the Superman I, please tell me I got those names right because I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm doubting, Se doubting I, I believe it's Siegel and Schuster yeah okay yeah. yeah so but they made what $140 for Superman yeah. right and then they couldn't they, they it wasn't until like that 1970s Superman movie came out that the fans forced DC to give them a little bit more money Jack Kirby is another great story there. Uh, Wally Wood, uh, Steve Ditko. At the comics landscape is littered throughout 120 years of comics history of people that went into contracts with uh, corporations and came out. That with, don't, don't believe me. Go to GoFundMe right now. Go, it, 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 maybe I'm full of shit. Pause the podcast. Go over to GoFundMe. Put in comic creator or comic inker or comic penciler and look at how many names come up. You'll start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Of all the people who need GoFundMe to get a liver transplant or to get or for a heart condition or, or to go see the dentist this week, yeah. scroll right through them. They got chewed up and spat out by the system. And it's been 120 years, folks. And it ain't going to change. Corporations, let's face it, at, at this point, we don't get to be surprised by it anymore. Corporations exist to create a profit, right? If it comes down between giving your artist better health care and better profit, profit's going to win. If it's going to come down between giving a better page rates for the creators or better profits, profit's going to win, right? 
we don't get to be surprised by this anymore. So yes, crowdfunding is a bear. It's, it's a whole full-time job. Uh, social media is frustrating as it can possibly be right now. The only problem is the other decision that you've got to make has 120 years telling you how it's going to end up. Every time I get tempted to say, <laughs> to say, oh, that's it. I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't, I don't want to try and figure out the, the, one more way to make social media work. Uh, I look at 120 years and I'm like, back to work, Geiger. <laughs> You're going to have to figure this out because 120 years tells you you ain't going the other way. I'm going to dive into my introspective questions. I, I can't follow up on that other than the fact, <laughs> the, only, the only way I could follow this up on is when Dave Clut did the stripped documentary yeah. Now it's the web comics basically saying, see a newspapers, you know, we, we've, we've survived. You have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to an extent, but I, I, I mean, I don't want to get too cocky because, you know, that day is coming for us too. If, if we're not careful. Right. And some people say maybe already has come and, and that, believe me, that, that keeps me up at night is, is that, that whole idea, because we came in, in the two thousands and, uh, the newspaper syndicated cartoonists really, by and large, hated us because they saw us as part of the problem. We were giving it away for free and we weren't real cartoonists. They resented us. And as a result, we never really got a chance in many cases. There were some, there were some standout moments, like Phil Folio is a great example, that story I told earlier. But for the most part, being able to access that older generation to get uh, institutional knowledge to get to get advice and stuff. Uh, when we came into comics, my generation, uh, it was very contentious. We had we were constantly fighting with the older generation, which is a, a huge reason that I kind of do what I do right between webcomics.com and writing the webcomics handbook and doing the comic lab podcast. I've got a real passion for sharing whatever I've learned, right, right or wrong, <laughs> you know, you, you decide whether it's a good fit for you, but I want to share what I've learned because I never had that when I was getting in and starting in this profession. Uh, we never had that for the most part. And I relish the ability to take a young cartoonist and say, okay, let's talk about how you're positioning yourself on social media. Let's talk about how to write a punchline. Let's talk about uh, character design and stuff like that. And, 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 so, you know, I, and, 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 and I do consultations for that matter where I can, I'll sit down and do one-on-one -on -one because all of that is something that I really am passionate about being able to be somebody that. Even, even if that, if I talk to that person and they walk away, like I did with Koo many years ago and said, nah, this guy's full of, full of beans. He's, he's, he's not right. Even if that's what you do, I've given you some way to look at it. And th that's something I'm passionate about. It's something I really, really get excited by is being able to talk with that new generation coming up and say, I, I got some thoughts for you. So, and then, because a lot of times on one hand, maybe they do what I tell them and, and, and I see them apply it and they turn the corner and, it, and it's a victory. And sometimes I see them take what I, what I showed them and they uh, transform it into something that's all their own and, and they put their own spin on it. They put their own ingenuity behind it and they come up with something completely different. And that's good too, you know. For those that are going to watch this and see the edited version, if you weren't here on the live stream, you're missing out on some really great content here. So <laughs> thank you, know, you. Thanks for all those that are actually sticking around to, to see this. So I appreciate it. The last four questions are this, and it's similar to inside the actor studio. They are introspective questions. I was going to ask Stan Lee that never occurred. So I ask creative and talented people like yourself, these same four questions. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, geez. I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can point one person out. Uh, I was, uh, Scott Kurtz was, a, was an early one. Uh, I, I took a look at what he was doing in, it, when I first discovered web comics in 2000s. And I was like, it was like, he's the person to watch. He knows what he's doing. I, I want to uh, emulate him. And, and then when I met him, 
turns out he's one of the nicest people I've ever met. And we, and just immediately took me seriously and, and was, was kind and approachable. And uh, we became friends instantly. Uh, so, so Scott would have to be near the top and I'm going to, I got to throw Dave in as well. Uh, my, my comic lab co-host, uh, because I felt very similarly about him. We had both come in at Keen spot about the same time. And, uh, he was somebody that had such an amount of polish to his work so early on. And somebody also was very, very sharp in regards to the business kind uh, side of comics that I, 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 he was somebody that, uh, it was very inspirational, but I'll be honest with you. If I had to go for the number one person and you're going to laugh and, and that's fine. Uh, but it's, it's my wife. And I'll tell you why, because way back when I started doing this, uh, it was a six day a week comic that I did for years with no breaks. There was never a break. Okay. Uh, and then it became a five day a week uh, after a few years. But the first several years of my doing this was uh, was six days a week, took an enormous amount of work. I was working pen and ink. It was a huge amount of time. And although I thought I was spinning gold, I can look back on it now. I can I can look at that work in my studio and and say, that was not great work. <laughs> you know, you were not writing, you were not writing great. I had flashes of brilliance. Don't, don't get me wrong, but by and large, I was not, I was not spinning the gold that I thought I was. Uh, but I was passionate about it. I had a passion for comics, which I think is probably as important as drawing or writing is, is just having that drive. I look back and, and I think about all of the time that I spent on doing that. And, and people in our social circles every now and again would pull her away, you know, so she was away from me. And they'd say, what do you really think about that? What do you really think about all the time he spends on comics? What do you think about that? And she would always look him in the eye and say, nah, it's cheaper than therapy. And uh, having her... In my, it, it, especially when I look back at that early stuff, I, I don't know why, I don't know what she saw. I don't know why she believed. I don't know why she was always my number one fan. Uh, <laughs> back in the day, back in the day for GeoCities, uh, we had a very rudimentary web counter, right? Rudimentary. And every day in the early, early days, I was getting closer and closer to having a hundred visitors on my website. Kurt, a hundred. I was getting closer and closer. One day I come home from work or, and I worked at the newspaper at the time, come home from work and that's kind of down. And she says, well, what's got you upset? And I said, I had 99 today. I came this close to this goal that I've had of having a hundred. I had 99 visitors today. Can you imagine 99 people wrote, read my crummy comic? That's amazing. But 99 and she got real quiet. And I said, what well, now? Why are you upset? She said, I forgot to visit today. <laughs> she would have been my 100, but, uh, uh, but, 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 it, whether she was number 100 or not, she was always there. I'm here because she was there. And she always, this was, has always been a team effort uh, for, for us. And uh, if I've got to, if, if I've got to put somebody in the number one spot, it's, it's her. And the fact that she'll be watching this as well. And if you didn't mention well, her, she, yeah. she is now, I'm going to, I'm going to drag her to it now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it, and it happens to be true. I'll, yeah, I'll be course. I'll be really honest with you. When it comes down to it, after 20 years, I've seen a lot of people uh, that were twice as talented as I, twi tw twice the writer, twice the artist, twice the everything. And sometimes I really do think that the only difference between me and that person is they didn't have a life partner like I had. I honest to God, it comes sometimes it comes down to that stuff. From a professional standpoint, you, of course, have an amazing career in, of course, comics for over 20 years. You have webcomics.com and, of course, Comic Lab Podcast with another amazing co-host with, of course, Dave Collette. And so professionally, you're successful in that regard. 
do you consider yourself personally successful? Ah, uh, I'm, I'm only successful in the rear view mirror. I'm never successful looking out front of the windshield. I'm only successful in the rear view mirror. When I can look back and say, oh my God, I'd done it for another year. I, I, they, they didn't find me out for the fraud that I am. Right. They, I, I didn't, I, they, they didn't all come crumbling down. I did. I didn't, uh, you know, do something hor you know, horribly stupid and bring my business down. I left my day job 10 years ago. Uh, and basically, cause I, I, the, the newspaper was having layoffs and it was very clear that I was either going to take the buyout or get cut. Uh, but the first, first couple of years of those 10 years were really touch and go. And, and, and then just all of a sudden I realized last year, 2022, that it, and in April, it had been 10 years that I've been doing this. And this has been my, my main source of income. And we've been doing well, we've been able to, we've been able to do the things that we want to do. That is successful. That feels like success, but it's always in the rear view mirror. <laughs> Am I going to be successful by the end of 2023? I have no idea. Because it, 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 as uh, it feels great to have done it, but the the next month is never promised. Next year is never promised. So successful with an asterisk. I'm I'm successful in the rearview mirror. That's the first I've heard that out of all the years I've been asking that question. I like that. Yeah. The reverse of success is failure. How yeah. do you deal with your failures? <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth, and then I'm going to tell you what I want you to believe. The <laughs> truth is, loudly, angrily, with a lot of pouting, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of loud noises, uh, is how I deal with my with my failures. That's that's the truth. Now I'm going to tell you what I want you to believe. Uh, and actually, the two work hand in hand because in, in going into the second part, after I'm done pouting. After I'm done yelling and screaming, uh, it comes this next part that I want you to pay attention to a little bit more than the pouting. Uh, wait, wait, I, I, and here's another one where my wife comes in because we have kind of like a shorthand when something uh, devastating or drastic or, or disappointing as a career setback, uh, she'll come up or, and I've, I've done this with her too. Uh, it, it's a two way street. We'll come up to the other person and say, uh, all right. You got 24 hours, 24 hours of pouting and then done. And then we got to, we've got to fix it. We've got to move on. We've got to do what comes next. And we give each other a 24 hour pouting window. And then it becomes time to do this next part. And the next part is when I am done pouting and sometimes it takes a little over 24 hours. I remind myself of all the other failures I've had because every major failure that I've had was something that led the way to either knowledge or another different type of success that I, I couldn't have been prepared for, right? I, my biggest failures were also my biggest learning moments. I learned so, you learn so much more from failure than you do from success. Uh, you learn so much by screwing things up. There's stuff uh, from, from the fact that I priced my first book wrong. And when it went out to Diamond and they made their first, it was very popular, uh, surprisingly enough. And they made their first order since I had printed uh, at the wrong price on my book. And since I had guessed wrong, I had the complete wrong way of coming up with the price for a book. When I went to fill that order, uh, I realized that I was about three to $500 in the hole. In other words, I wasn't making a profit. I was paying Diamond to get these books into comic shops to the tune of three or five hundred dollars. I learned about pricing a book after that, <laughs> and I never forgot it. And failure is like that. It, it stung like hell that first time to have had that experience. It, it really hurt, but I learned so much uh, in doing that it made me a better business person. And, and speaking as a, as a, as an artist, as a business person, as a human being that has made a lot of failures, uh, that, that came with a lot of learning, right? Uh, at watching my comic after I had quit my day job and my comic, my entire business was built on the ad model, right? I was making my mortgage payments on ads. Okay. When ad blockers came up that, very quickly funneled down. 
terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But it led me to a point where I had to solve problems, solve business problems, uh, innovate in ways that I, I hadn't thought of innovating, made money happen uh, because I had to make money happen, right? One of Phil's piece of advice, Phil Folio, one of his advice is don't have a plan B. <laughs> don't have a plan B because then you'll use it. And if you don't, if you only have a plan A and you're, you find yourself on your keister, you're going to find a way to make plan A work because there is no plan B. Not so sure whether in today's economics, I'm not so sure I feel comfortable giving that advice to somebody else, but be that as it may, that's the situation I found myself in. And that's when I first started to look into crowdfunding and things like Kickstarter and Patreon. After that, the strength of my business, after having left advertising completely and gone all in on crowdfunding, it's night and day. I'm in a much better place, but it wouldn't have come without the failure of that first system that I'd put in place. So after the pouting comes the reminding myself that these moments, even though they really, really suck, are usually the way you get to the next step. And you've got to get in there and do all the hard work and make it over to the other side uh, so that you can show up on a podcast later and talk about it. <laughs> funny you mentioned the whole plan a thing from phil because he mentioned the same thing earlier this year so it's, yeah. it's still a staple for uh yeah. for his for for the advice in general i love it the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic creator podcast co-host or host or maybe it's a business model of some kind that they've made similar to webcomics.com giving advice maybe you've inspired them in some way shape or form how can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, that's great. Uh, listen, uh, the fact that they would be, uh, this fictional person uh, would be asking that question in the first place is actually the biggest step. Uh, the way to, uh, that I think that you can be inspirational is to do your best work and to be uh, helpful to somebody when, whenever you can. If somebody's got a question, you answer it to the best of your ability. If they've got a, a, a situation, you can't, you can't step in, you can't stop and, and donate hours and hours of time necessarily, but you can answer simple questions. You can point people in directions. It, it goes back to that whole way that we came into comics in the early 2000s. Again, uh, we came in very, very much under duress. And I, I think the best way to be inspirational is, is to be available right? Is, is to be available and open yourself up to sharing that stuff. And also not for nothing to be willing to, uh, to hear somebody say, eh, that's not for me, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> the damnedest thing about inspiration is you don't get to decide how they're inspired. You might be trying to inspire somebody to go left and they're hearing you and they're going to go right. You know, you don't get to, you don't, don't get to call your inspiration. You be, you've got to be willing to accept that they're going to take that inspiration and go their own direction with it. And, and that's their right. That That's their prerogative. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, well, let's see. <laughs> I think the best title uh, for my book would be Delusions of Grandeur, not delusions with an e but dilutions with an i in other words grandeur diluted down i think that's a very apt title uh because sometimes we get trapped into this mindset of thinking i'm doing all this great important amazing work and and to be a creative person you've got to be a little have a little bit of an ego right that's something we don't talk about much but even the shyest among us even the ones that are beset with imposter syndrome we still have a have a, a little bit of ego to say i'm still going to make that creative choice and put it out there right and so i that would be kind of my book hopefully would come with the reminder that as as grand as you think it all is at the end of the day it's just comics it's something that somebody is going to read it's going to take them five seconds to read that thing that you spent hours on and and that's okay the goal is to kind of make that person's life a little bit brighter in those five seconds and and to instill a relationship where they come back and have another five seconds later so this thing that we think is very grand uh, is actually kind of diluted down from what we think it is. And that's okay. Uh, in fact, it's still a, a lot better than 
uh, than many of us get in terms of satisfaction. Uh, in terms of the soundtrack, that's that I, I'd have to really think about that one. <laughs> part of me, part of me, the, uh, part of me is very, very tempted to go with a Weird Al uh, soundtrack, or even go even further back to Spike Jones, who was a predecessor to uh, Weird Al back in, in, I think, in the 1940s. Yeah, because he had some World War II stuff. In other words, stuff that does not, it, 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 the, the, the common thread between those things is that it's actually music, musically, in terms of its musicality, very good stuff, very excellent musicians, great uh, talent going into that stuff. And it completely does not take itself seriously. And that's kind of my goal for myself is to someday build up my skills to the extent that somebody thinks that I'm doing uh, a high quality of work, then it's something I'm always trying to kind of get towards. But at the same time, retain that taking yourself seriously. I think that's kind of where the, the, the biggest amount of happiness is. Love it. Well, Brad, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular <laughs> episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you so much, Kurt. This was an absolute delight. I, I really enjoyed this. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, ah. social media, patrons, anything else you'd love to promote on the show? No, oh, fantastic. Well, uh, the best the best place to point you is my website, uh, Evil Inc., which is evil hyphen ink, I-N-C, Dot com. If you go to Evil Inc. with a K, that's a Coheed and Cambria thing. And I've disappointed people at co comic conventions for years when they came up looking for Coheed and Cambria and got me. So make sure you spell it with, an, with a C, evil-inc.com. And, and that really is kind of the hub for everything. You can check me out on Twitter. It's just at Geiger, G-U-I-G-A-R, like guitar, but with a G for a T. And of course, check me out at Patreon. We are absolutely having a ball over there. In terms of doing Not Safe for Work, I've got over uh, 1,400 Not Safe for Work comics and illustrations uh, that you get access to the minute that you sign up. And also, uh, we built a very friendly, wonderful group of uh, community of people who are comics fans that you get to uh, talk to on the Discord and everything. So check that out at patreon.com slash Geiger. Nice. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others. Actually, it's probably 1,200 by now, but I've lost nice. count. So Good for you. <laughs> thanks. It's It's been a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> At uh, TGTmedia.com or TwoGeeksTalking.com, the website is going through an update. So unfortunately, it's not quite working very well. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years because of reasons. And you can find that at two geeks talking .com, or just search for two geeks talking on any of your favorite podcast streaming services. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on two geeks talking.